So, this evening I organized, with a lot of help from the American Association of Wine Economists, a tasting of Riesling wines, dry wines, from Germany's biggest wine growing region, Rheinhessen which had really a terrible reputation even just three or four years ago. And why did it have that bad reputation? Well, it was the homeland of a wine called Liebfraumilch. And Liebfraumilch became synonymous with the very worst side of the German wine industry. Cheap schlock. And it was therefore also for me very extraordinary, really uh, sometimes incomprehensible, to see what happened to this region, how it turned itself inside out and went from being a terrible faded shadow of the golden October of Liebfraumilch into the dream factory of dry white wines. I'm Orly Ashenfelder, president of the American Association of Wine Economists, here with Stuart Piggott, great expert on German wines, maybe the greatest, and we're going to taste some of the wines from the new Rheinhessen tonight in our favorite restaurant for doing these functions, Trestle on 10th. Hi. I'm Stuart Piggott. Um, as you can hear, I'm British. Um, <laughs> but I've lived the last 20 years in Berlin, in Germany, and I've spent my time for even longer than that studying the wines of Germany in as much depth as I can possibly manage. And I'm here in New York for a couple of months to work on a serious project about the Riesling grape. So let's start. I'm a great fan of yours, great admirer of yours. Um, why don't you start by telling us what the new Rheinhessen is? Well, there is a very, very old Rheinhessen which goes back to Charlemagne, uh, or the Germans called him Karl den Grossen. Um, so we're talking about the ninth century, um, with uh, wine growing starting in a serious way. And this area on the left bank of the Rhine, just before it turns north, um, are around um, Frankfurt. Now, isn't Charlemagne French? French, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, at this time, there was no difference between oh, France so, and Germany. Ah, that, that, that only developed okay. after his sons started fighting amongst themselves. All right, yeah. thank you. <coughs> Go ahead. But the old Rheinhessen is really Liebfraumilch and other cheap and sweet generic wines, um, bland stuff with very little character and really each product tasting very much like the other. And this was an economic model which was heading nowhere and then suddenly slammed into a brick wall at the end of the 1980s. And it took some time for a new identity in the region to emerge, but of around 12 years ago, 13 years ago, the turn of the century, suddenly all kinds of stuff started happening there where I thought to myself, is this real? Um, what am I supposed to make of this? Because the, the break with the past was so dramatic. And for a while I felt, well, you know, we, we journalists, we are, we are writing this up and it's a great story, um, but how much is really changing out there in the real world? And then a couple of years back, I saw some statistics for sales in German supermarkets. I mean, the very bottom end of the market, yeah? And the change was so dramatic. I'd never seen anything like that before. In two or three years, uh, an almost complete turnaround in the orientation of a region of 26,500 hectares. And, and all Riesling? Yeah. Is it all Riesling? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, back in 1990, it was just over 7% Riesling, and now it's up to 15. So the area with Riesling doubled. But this is not an isolated phenomenon. A lot of other really interesting grape varieties grew by 100 or 200% during the same period. Now, I want to interrupt Stuart for one second to ask him a little bit of a personal question. Stuart is English, uh, fluent in German, a great expert, maybe the greatest expert on German wines. How in the world did that happen? 
one thing leads to another, you know, and uh, we call it the slippery slope in England. You, once you've stepped onto that, you know, and you've taken a couple of steps, you're already sliding downhill, and there's really no way back up. Yeah, I know this, <coughs> this is a very wishy-washy dis description, but actually in, it, it describes very well what happened to me. Um, thank you all for, uh, for coming. Some of you came a long way, particularly particular thanks to the people who came from Massachusetts. Um, yeah, um, why taste the Rieslings of the New Rheinhessen now? Well, last May I sat together with Carl in Hearth and I showed him a few of the new wines and he kind of flipped out about them. <laughs> and then I showed him, then I showed him this thing this statistic which shows you the development of the sales of those wines at the supermarket level, at the very bottom level of the market during recent years. And then he really flipped out because he said he hadn't seen anything like that before, that kind of change in that few years. Um, and I said to him, yeah, this, this graphic was really important for me because for some years I'd be uh, like my colleagues in Germany, and we've all been really excited about what was happening in this, in this region, which previously had just been a kind of amorphous area of agriculture and, well, bulk wine production, a bulk wine production area. No? Um, so we've been talking it up for quite some time, and I got to a point where I felt, well, maybe we're just, it's all puff. It's all journalistic puff. And then I saw that graphic and I thought, holy shit, it is anything but puff. Yeah. 2011 is a very good vintage, no question about that. Now that an, another vintage is in the cellar, the 2012, some people have started talking 11 down. This is bullshit. These were extremely ripe grapes and every wine grower who was doing a good job in the vineyard picked beautifully clean fruit. I saw photos which made my jaw drop. It was positively pornographic. <laughs> yeah. So what should be better than pornographically golden, perfect bunches this big with tiny little berries? Um, I mean, that's what gives you a great Riesling. At least that's the ideal material for a great dry Riesling. So when I selected the wines, what I was looking for, I was trying to show the diversity of this region. I mean, it's 26,500 hectares. That's, that's not a little corner in somebody's back garden, yeah? So inevitably, the wines are very diverse, and that I had to show. And it seemed to me only logical to take the 2011 vintage because this was a really good year everywhere in the region. And therefore, you, you have wines which, are, first of all, taste good, and secondly, nobody can, in the region can say, well, it didn't work out in our corner. Why are you forcing us into this uh, situation? So for me, it was entirely logical to take the 2011 vintage and to do the comparisons with that, because really everywhere the grapes were beautifully ripe and the ripening conditions were almost perfect. But, you know, wine is complicated and people, they're always looking for something to knock. So this vintage has also become a bit controversial with some of my colleagues saying, oh, they're all too fat and They'll never age, they taste too good already. I've heard all these arguments, I don't know how many times. But you know, it's very simple. A good wine tastes good, and ripe grapes make a good wine. Unripe grapes, this is a real challenge, and it might work out sometimes, but some time. Tonight's tasting was really fascinating for me to see how different the reactions of different people to the same wines were. Um, nobody seemed to be disappointed with the tasting, rather the opposite. 
um, there seemed to be a great deal of excitement at the table, and I was very pleased. <laughs> uh, that, that was the whole idea, uh, but you don't know until it happens. But it was very striking how differently people reacted to the same wine tasted from the same glass in the same room where everything else was the same. So it was definitely people's personal preferences and um, inclinations, temperament. That plays, these play a huge role with wine. Nobody really talks about that.